Revelation. We are in chapter 9, uh, roughly verse 11, 7 through 11. We are uh, in the uh, first part of this chapter. We uh, saw an angel come down from heaven with the key to the bottomless pit or the abyss, and out came a cloud of smoke. And then out of the cloud of smoke came a horde of these things. Uh, designed in the vision to, quote, torment men. Not the environment, but men. Now the environment, so to speak, had already been struck by the first four trumpets in chapter 8. Chapter 9, the 5th and 6th trumpets are directed to men, not the sun, the moon, the stars, the grass, the rivers, the sea, the sun, and so forth that we ran into that was struck in chapter 8. Uh, <clears throat> rather frightening, creepy looking, and who's on the receiving end of the, I don't know whether it's a lady or a gentleman, <laughs> that women. They have hair, hair, hair like women. You said that was coming to torment me. I don't know if you meant that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I did not. Mankind. Okay. Who's the one who said not to have consent? Yes. Oh, boy. Okay. okay. These are what God shows John as a representative of what the Roman Empire was going to be subjected to. Okay, this is a visionary picture of what God wanted John to see as what's going to be the fifth plague or the fifth trumpet on Rome. But all of them have just been partial. Yes, the third. Thank you. The third, the third, and then this one was just for five months. Correct. Correct. Uh, in fact, all of the trumpets are partial. All of the trumpets. We don't get to full and final judgment on Rome until we get to the bowls in uh, chapter 16. Uh, are we ready to go to verse 12? Any questions? Okay. That was the first one. These creatures. The first one... Let's pull this up. The first woe is past. Behold, two woes are still coming after these things. And here we go with the first one. Then the sixth angel sounded, or the sixth trumpet. I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. One saying to the sixth angel, who had the trumpet, quote, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates, and the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released so that they would kill a third of mankind. Remember, this is also directed toward men. Excuse me. Mankind. Humanity. I'll have to integrate that a little bit more. Probably in my vocabulary. And they were... And these, during the last one, during, during the scary looking ones, yeah. they were just tormenting. Because mm -hmm. it said that they prayed for death, or longed for death, that it would become. And now, that comes. Third, a third of them, yes. yes. Now, the idea that I pray to die and can't, that's about the ultimate in misery, I guess is a good word, that you can have. I am so miserable, I want to die, I'm ready to die, but I can't die. And so they just are seen as continuing in this state of misery. Uh, verse 16, the number of the armies of the horsemen was 200 million. John says, I heard the number of them. Now, if you'll remember in verse 13, the sixth angel sounded, and the voice came from the four horns of the golden altar. Now, does anyone remember what else we have heard from that altar of incense? The souls, under it crying out the souls of the saints crying out for vengeance, wondering when 
Lord, how long is it going to be before you judge these people who are persecuting us so badly? And that's in chapter 8, verses 3 through 5. That's one of the uh, uh, trumpets, earlier trumpets, the previous chapter. And these prayers, remember, were the reason, or given as one of the reasons anyway, uh, the reasons for these trumpet judgments in the first place. Because God heard the prayers of his afflicted people, answered that prayer, and the trumpets were the result. So we're at the same spot, the same location in the vision as we were before. And uh, in verse 14, uh, these four angels, of course, uh, and the 200 million man army in verse 16 are the resources in the vision which God has at his disposal to use in judgment upon Rome. 200 million of these, and not to mention the person that we started on with our first slide, the locusts. So he's pictured as having those in his command. In this trumpet, he has these 200 million horsemen at his disposal to uh, pass judgment upon Rome with. And of course, this uh, I think we may have discussed this last week in verse 14. These angels had been previously holding these forces back. There was a delay. We talked about that. Uh, and of course, I think I put up a map that the boundary of the Roman Empire was on the east. On the east was the Euphrates River. And it was from those quarters that the enemies of the Jews came from and also the Parthian army, which we identified with the first of the first seal, the white horse, because they were so, they made life miserable for the Roman army. Okay, and the Romans feared that, and once lost 10,000 men in the battle. So this idea of the angels releasing this army from the Euphrates River stands for what? What do you think? What finally brought down Rome at the end? Military invasion. Military invasion. Wait, not from the Euphrates. <clears throat> no. Oh. Uh, no, not from the Euphrates. No, from from the uh, obviously most of them came from what's down from the north of Italy. But th this is what the reference is in, to, is to, and I've got an example. Oh, that's the map in Isaiah eight of the connection between the Euphrates River and the military might that is connected with it. It says, Isaiah writes, Now therefore the Lord is about to bring on them the strong and abundant waters of the Euphrates. And who is symbolized by that? Even the king of Assyria and all of his glory and it, these waters, or the Assyrian army, will rise up over all its channels and go through its banks. Then it will sweep on into Judah, his own people, for their sins, and it will overflow and pass through. It will reach, uh, reach even up to the neck, and the spread of its wings will fill the breadth of your land. Oh, Emmanuel. So you can see here the connection between the threat of military might and the Euphrates River. I've got one more from the previous chapter in Isaiah. It says, that In that day, and this is also spoken against his own people, Judah. The Lord will shave with a razor hired from the regions beyond the Euphrates, that is, with the king of Assyria, we just read about him earlier, the, hair and the, uh, the head and the hair of the legs, and it will also remove the beard. The last part about that is disgrace, okay? Defeat, disgrace, is what the Assyrian army has been tapped by God to inflict upon his people Judah. And the connection is with the Euphrates River and the crossing of that, the military might that comes upon, in this case in the vision, not Judah, but Rome. Okay, so we'll call this Euphrates 
these verses the threat of military life which was going to eventually bring Rome to her knees and bring the Roman Empire to an end. Uh, in verse 15, I think I've got a couple of things I wanted to mention about. Yeah, verse 15. Uh, verse 16, no. I've already mentioned verse 16, what I wanted to be, uh, mention. Yep. Okay. Okay, by the way. Huh? I'm sorry? What about the Oh. I've already talked about it. You did. You brought it up that it was a partial judgment. All of these trumpets are partial judgment. For what reason? To bring them to do what? Repent. But, but what I was curious about was that he had prepared the hour of the day and the month for it. Oh, yes. They were commissioned, shall we say, for that very time and for that very purpose to vindicate and save his people from the persecution by destroying the Roman enemy. The time, I don't remember which verse that is. Oh, verse 15. Yes, for that specific time, for that specific day, for that, and I'll add this, for that specific purpose, God calls upon them. Now, the fifth trumpet calls attention to Rome's vulnerability because of what? was her problem in the first 11 verses. The smoke and the locusts symbolized what? Internal corruption. Remember? Economic no, I don't think that's economy. I think the smoke and the locusts represent moral corruption, decadence, a rot from within inside, from within. And that would naturally lead into the next trumpet, which makes the nation what? when that happens from within. Vulnerable to outside military pressure because it's a signal that the nation and reality that the nation is on a downhill spiral and Rome was just like that. So, what are we being told in all of this? That God is going to consume the enemy and he has the resources to do it. Those lovely creatures we saw at first, and then a 200 million man army of horsemen to carry out his judgments. Remember, these are not literal. These are pictures of the fearsome things that Rome is going to have to face from God Almighty because of her persecution of God's people. Any questions? <clears throat> John. Oh, okay. It's like, this is like when Jesus said, the day and hour, no man knoweth not even the Son of Man, but only God, that, that this was once again, God had an appointed Oh, time. okay, that's a good one. A schedule. Right. Verse 15, that's a good one. John says that that probably holds that God had prepared for the exact time that these things were going to be carried out, and I have no doubt that he did, and that is a very good way, I guess, of expressing it in verse 15. Okay, we're going to hopefully get to verse 17. John says, and this is how I saw the vision, in the vision, the horses, the 200 million, okay, God's army, the horses and those who sat on them. Now we're going to learn about what they're like. First, they had breastplates the color of fire and of hyacinth. And I've read about the hyacinth. I, I really was ignorant about that. It's a gem uh, which is probably by the ancients, probably refers to the amethyst or the sapphire. Color wise. Color wise. Brimstone. What is brimstone? Burning sulfur. Sulfur, yes. And it has a suffocating odor. I mean, that's the best way I know how to describe it. And it is yellow in color. And the heads of the horses are like lions. 
And out of these horses, lions, heads, proceeds fire and smoke and brimstone. A wonderful combination. Yeah. I know we we put this completely aside, but in the last quarter release. In the quarter release? No, no, no. The commentaries. Oh, the commentaries. Uh, the man that wrote that, you know, he did have a view that it was that the vision was all the way to the end of time. That there were different events. Correct. And he said this was one of the armies that came out, uh, maybe the Turks, I don't remember, I can't remember, but he said that that was their colors, and that they resembled that, well, and that when they, that they were the first ones to use guns, in an early form of a gun, okay. whoever it was, anyway, in battle, and that that would appear that their horses were putting out Smoke and, smoke and fire and brimstone. And brimstone. Oh, okay. But, but that's obviously not because that was a thousand years the ago. Yeah, we only missed that by a thousand years. Yeah, well, that, that was his yeah. view that it was. Oh, okay. The time. Well, if you want to take the continuous historical view, I can see where that would fit in perfectly. Yeah. Now, and, so, and when I said the first time I read it, uh, and that's uh, it, it was by necessity, not wrong to me by anything I've done myself. But, um, <laughs> Uh, but it was, I mean, it fit, after reading it all, it fit in perfectly, and that was kind of, that was the view that I had held over the years, except that it kind of got too convenient. I thought. But, oh, okay. Okay. Okay, we're, oh, we just, oh, okay, we just left the wonderful smelling yellow brimstone. Verse 18, a third of mankind, there's the limitation again, was killed by these three plagues, by the fire, the smoke, and the brimstone, which proceeded out of their mouths, for the power of the horses is in their mouths, as we've just obviously seen, and they've got one more place for their power, in their tails. They're not normal horses, though. For their tails are like serpents, and they have heads. So the ends of their tails resemble a snake's Hey, the, uh, huh? the no, I cannot. <laughs> I don't think I have got. I don't think I, I don't think I found anything that would. Uh, no, I don't think I found anything that satisfied me on the just picture. Wait. The next week, just go ahead and draw it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Wasn't there one of the eight roaming or breathing dolphins that had a snake? Medusa. Medusa had snakes for hair. Yes. Wonderful lady. <laughs> and of course, all of these details, folks, are added for what purpose? To scare them. Yeah. They're not details that we need to get caught up in because your guess is as good as mine, which is as good as Jody's, which is as good as anybody else's. And the answer is that nobody knows what they mean. But you take the entire picture. Oh, I get it. I get it. I understand it. Uh, they are there to make the vision more dramatic, and I don't know how it could be much more <coughs> dramatic than the description we've just read in the last three or four verses. And, uh, and of course, when you see a picture like this, it's enough to terrorize anyone. Uh, should be. Should be, yes, yes. And of course, this entire picture uh, symbolizes the external invasion as one of God's instruments for uh, punishing the oppressors of his people. By the way, locusts are also used in Joel <coughs> chapter 2, swarm of locusts, but they don't look like this person thing that we saw in the first slide. They look like regular locusts, which I take to be a grasshopper on steroids. <laughs> is, is that pretty accurate? Okay, I've never seen one. Why? They do make a lot of noise, like the cicadas. Okay. Of course, when you've got 100 billion of them coming at you and it darkens the sun and the moon, I can see where they would be extremely dangerous and fearsome. 
Old chapter, verse 20. The rest of mankind, the other two-thirds, who were not killed by these plagues, all of them, still, what? Did not repent of the works of their hands, so as not to worship, here's their list of sins, that so as not to worship demons and the idols of gold and of silver and of brass and of stone and of wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. So their chief sin was idolatry, and they did not repent of their murders or of their sorceries or of their immorality or of their thefts. So we have added to their idolatry these other four wonderful characteristics which tell us the reason they refused to repent. That's the kind of people that the Romans are judged to be in this vision and prime candidates for the judgment of God himself. But this also shows what the purpose of all the plagues have been. Correct. This gives us an entire picture of everything from chapter 8, all of chapter 8, all of chapter 9. These are the efforts in the vision of God to get these people to change their ways. So we don't have to run into the holes, which are poured out in chapter 16. Now God, I think today, still gives us warnings that you're headed in the wrong direction. I think he still does that. Uh, these two verses indicate that the object of this judgment was Christians. No. The target of all of these judgments was Rome. Okay? Those who did not have the mark of God. Correct. <clears throat> not all Christians, but as I tried to emphasize earlier, the Christians are going to suffer. In this external invasion, the internal corruption, they are going to suffer, unfortunately, but the judgment is not aimed at them. They are, what can you call, collateral damage. Yeah. Uh, and this may be a part of their trial as they mix with the world during their earthly pilgrimage. But the trial, as far as they're concerned, is not God's judgment aimed at them at all. Uh, so, in summary, chapter 9 tells us of internal corruption from, it's from the inside, going to bring Rome down, and external invasion. The Euphrates symbolizes that, which is going to ultimately bring them down from the outside. So, we have seen these two instruments of God's punishment. Uh, so the question is, what is going to be next? Because we've got a pretty good gap between the trumpets at the end of chapter 9 and the bowls in chapter 16, which carry us forward. The, the bowls, uh, the, excuse me, the trumpets and the bowls carry us forward time-wise, if you please, okay? Uh, now, if God has done this, that we have seen in chapter 8 and 9, and the Rome has still not repented, then what can God do? That must be on their mind in the vision. Said, these judgments didn't bring them to repentance. Now what are we going to do? How then are these people, the Romans, going to be stopped? I think I've got a slide here. So what would you think at this point of our study that he's talking about Rome that we should apply to our lives? Okay. Yes, there's much that's applicable to our lives. Yes. As long as you understand that the vision was written with the target of the seven churches of Asia, God's people, and their oppressor Rome, then you can say, yes, there are uh, Lessons that Lord Wallace needs to learn from this too. Which are to this point, what would you say? That God hears my prayer. That God has all the assets that He needs to take care of whatever problems I've got. That judgment is going to come upon God's enemies, no matter what, no matter how big they are. 
no matter what size army they have. Yeah, and that my job is to be a overcomer in spite of what, how bad things may seem. Now, that's all, that's all the top of my head. And that God will give you a chance to repent. Yeah, oh, that God gives us a chance to repent, yes. Peter said not willing that, uh, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And we read that God puts off things until human sin reaches a certain point. This is very much like the Old Testament. It's just <clears throat> spread out in the Old Testament. God, he, he, gave, he owned his people. He gave them the law. And he said, now this is what's going to happen when you turn from it. And the man of blessing and the man of blessing. In, in the, during the New Testament times, he gave everybody a chance. He told them what was going to happen. They were preaching all the time what was going to happen to them if, if they turned away. And then in the Old Testament, the first thing, you know, the first thing that happens, Syria comes and carries part of them away. And, and once again, bloodshed and, and all of this. And the, oh, misery. And even, and the, and the Christians had to, I mean, the, his people had to endure, endure it too, but he said he would preserve the righteous remnant through it. Yes. And then he brought them back and made them a people again and gave them another chance. And when they fell this time, Babylon came in. And it was a bigger destruction. The temple was destroyed, and, and it was a much greater destruction. Since they had not repented, they, they did the same things. And then, after that, when they came back, and he rebuilt the temple and, and was with them, he started saying right then, but you are not following mine until finally Manasseh comes along and he says, that's it. I'm washing my hands off you, and now look forward to the final, the, the final judgment and destruction. And that happened in 70 AD. Sure is. And Jerusalem was completely destroyed and the people so were scattered. It all through the Old Testament. But it was, this is just a compressed version of it and, and, and more colorful. <laughs> more colorful, more descriptive. Yes. Thing. Yes. It's the same story over and over and over is what John's trying to say as he deals, tries to deal with us. He sends Me. these first plagues, and then they weren't enough. And so he goes on with what we're going to see from now on. Yes. He should have threatened the firsthand. He should have won. <laughs> the firstborn. The firstborn. It reminds you of the plagues in Egypt. Yeah. It really does. Prior to that, it was a jet. Oh, okay. 
All right. Okay, I wrote this summary. I hope it helps. Uh, I wrote up some summaries for some people here, by the way, if you would like a copy of it, of where we are so far, it's so that you don't get lost. I've tried to summarize it in these uh, points here. And if you've got any questions before we get to chapter 10, now it's time to ask. I can make copies of it. I'd be glad to. I'd be glad to. So that, that helps me stay on the track because I have to remember where I've been before I can figure out where I'm going. <laughs> okay. All right. Verse, verse, chapter 10, verse 1. <clears throat> I'm sorry. The seals reveal what is coming. The actual judgments, the first, the trumpets and the bowls reveal what is to come later. The trumpets in the vision begin the actual execution of God's partial judgments upon Rome, which we just went through. The bowls, chapter 16 in the vision, are the actual execution or the carrying out of God's full and final judgments upon Rome. Hence, we understand better his reluctance, God's reluctance, and I, I think he's talking, I think I'm talking, I know I'm talking about the half hour delay in chapter 1 to actually begin his judgments. Remember there was silence in heaven? Because God doesn't want to do this. And God's people will suffer in these as well, uh, as well in these judgments. No, no, no. No, but they all should come to what? Repentance. That's what God aimed is all throughout the book, even warned the seven churches of Asia that you're on the wrong path and you need to repent, especially Jezebel and some of those other. Uh, I tell you what, we're going to stop right here. We've just got a couple of minutes. It's a good place to stop. Uh, chapter 10 is a parenthesis, like chapter 7 was, okay? The book is full of those where, what's another good word for a parenthesis? An aside, an aside, okay? Which doesn't carry the story chronologically forward, but we get to learn some things that are going on, shall we say, maybe behind the scenes, and learn a little bit more about where we've been and where we're going. Okay? Anything else? All right, let's pray. Father, for wisdom we pray. For understanding we pray and for the ability to take the lessons that we have learned and carry them out. Father, I know that we do need help here too. We pray for those whose names have been mentioned tonight as suffering from physical ailments and we pray that you would be with them. Uh, thank you for Jesus, and thank you for forgiving us of our sins. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen.